thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. I'm going to speak to you about training in a Level 3 hospital, particularly the Irish experience in Sligo. First thing I'd ask you to have a think about is what would the, would the training, the doctors of the future look like? What will they be? What's the end destination? Let's have a look. If this is what you're after, then hands up, Sligo University Hospital, any Level 3 hospital has no role to play. If this is what you're after, this is something we provide in abundance. We do the simple things and we do them very well. Let's have a look at the cornerstones of good medical training. Respect of the trainee, the trainer and the patient. Support, we have close consultant supervision and a, a big consultant presence on the ground. Inclusivity, it's been that big fish in the small pond where the trainees are listened to, included and involved and they would be a trainee on, on all of our management committees. And an open non-judgmental culture. Let's have a look at the trainees at the end of their training schemes and the beginning of the consultant years. What are their perceived deficiencies? Leadership and management skills are by far and away the biggest thing that they perceive they're deficient in, less so clinical skills. And leadership and management experience is something we can provide very easily and very well. Sligo University Hospital is a hospital on the west coast, it's on the western seaboard, so it's three hours from Dublin. So if you're a trainee and you're asked to relocate for three months or six months stint, that's difficult. It's difficult personally and in terms of rent, etc, etc. Equally, trainees sometimes feel that they're out of the training hub, therefore they're away from the core where the jobs are and that they'd be forgotten about when the jobs have been divvied up. We have 72 consultants. We have 174 non-consultant hospital doctors. We have 16 specialist registrars, three doing their general medicine and three specialty registrars. The, we would generally get them in the beginning of their training years, in the beginning of their training when they need slightly more support. But equally, we can provide leadership management role modeling skills with a close consultant SPR role for the, the end of training. We have a very good GP training scheme with 18 trainees. Again, they might only be doing four months medicine in their training, so they need a lot of support. We have trainees, we have seven from Pakistan who are on a two-year secondment to Sligo or other hospitals, and they would go back then at the end of the two years. Again, high calibre clinically, but requires support in terms of cultural and organisational adaptations. We have 93 non-training doctors. They're not on a training scheme. They, who are they? In, in terms of the Irish graduates, they tend to be on a breather year to decide perhaps what, they, what training scheme they want to do. Sometimes they want to do the first year registrar job and somewhere which offers support. It's an easy, it's a nice environment to do that, to do your first year registrar training. Um, sometimes we have them here, they just come to surf for the year. If that's not beyond the realms of possibility, we have quite a number that do that. The bulk of them are from Pakistan and Sudan and they have quite significant training done at home and they come over here for further training. They see themselves as training doctors. They're not in a training scheme and they won't get their training recognised over here. So by and large, they fail to progress. So there's significant difficulties with these young doctors. Uh, how do we nurture them? We treat everybody equal from consultant down to interns. Everybody does the same training, does the same uh, formal teaching and is expected to have at least an 80% attendance at all our teaching. We offer workshops, we offer training days, we offer grand rounds twice a week, we have journal clubs, we have simulation sessions. There's a lot of training. It's just the formal certification of that training is another issue. What about their plans? When we survey those junior doctors, the non-training scheme doctors, 50% of them plan to go back to their native country. The other 50% do not. So from our point of view, when they come to us for a career advice, it's extremely difficult. By and large, most of them would end up going to the UK. They have a more structured scheme over there for the, the, the doctors who aren't consultants, but aren't uh, in, in young, younger doctors either. There's locally appointed doctors. There's associate specialists. The British Medical Association have looked at this. They've looked at top-up training to bring them on to a certificate of equivalence on the specialist register to then move them on to be consultants. Secondment opportunities for significant specific training, time limited. They might train them to be in, to do work in audit, to work in clinical governance, to be examiners in exams, something of that nature, something specific that they will excel in. There'll be workplace assessments of them in that. They have regional study days purely for these for these individuals. They have a tutor assigned in each hospital for that in, for those trainees or those non-training doctors. Um, and that tutor is responsible for their for um, their education, for their accreditation, for their support and making sure their jobs are what they say they are. They offer a lot of master classes specifically aimed at this group of doctors. The Royal College of Physicians did a training survey in 2016 of postgraduate training with about a 36% response rate. And they found that they had a 50 
point scale that the Dublin hospitals were reported as, uh, by the trainees as a, as a, from a quality of training perspective as 34 out of 50 and, and the non-training, the non-big training hospitals were came up at 33. So we're not that far behind outside the main hubs. So we do our own survey every year. We do a survey of all the trainees and the consultants from 2018 to 2000, 2011 to 2018. Um, as a paper-based training and I will, I will go through some of the key questions in that and I'll benchmark them against the GMC's training survey which is done last year. So let's have a look. Let's have a look at overall job satisfaction. It's a Likert scale and the question we asked was I have good job satisfaction from the post. Strongly agree, agree all the way down to strongly disagree. We have improved from 63% to 83% in since 2018 and that would be equivalent to the GMC rate. It's pretty comparable to the 81.9% when they were asked to rate their job satisfaction. I have supportive supervision. 83% of our trainees reported appropriate supportive supervision, which is comparable to the GMC's rate of 88.2%. My one worry is that that 14 and 13 that strongly disagree, that hasn't moved much. That's a difficult one. We know where the deficits are. It's just a difficult one to, to get that appropriate supervision in for them. And that's, that's my next task. Let's have a look at clinical responsibility appropriate to my grade, either above my grade or below my grade. So that's about 84% feel that they often or usually have clinical responsibility appropriate to their grade. More precisely, are they asked to do tasks above their capabilities without supervision? It's between 71 and 60 and 67% were rarely to never asked to do tasks above their capabilities. What is worrying is the 8% who were asked to do tasks above their capabilities without supervision. Having said that, the GMC, they don't have in the 2019, but if you look at the 2012 survey, they had 16% of their trainees asked. So we compare very well if we're only looking at 8%. Now, this is the hot potato. I get time away from my clinical activity to attend teaching. I'm talking about protected teaching. This is something we've worked very hard on. We've gone from 42% to 79% get protected teaching time and aren't interrupted by clinical activity in that time. How did we do it? I personally went around to every ward and I spoke to the nurse manager in every ward and asked them, please don't bleep doctors during these set training hours unless it's an emergency. I have a sticker on every bleep list just beside the, the, the telephones on the wards to say, please do not bleep doctors during protected training time. What I then do is if you're bleeped, if you're a junior doctor at one of our formal training sessions, if you're bleeped during that, I answer the bleep. And I, I've gone from about 18 bleeps in an hour to about two recently over the last number of years. It's gone down to two bleeps in an hour. And I usually, when I pick up the phone and they hear it's my voice at the end of the line, I get, oh, oh I'm so sorry, it's training time, isn't it? I'm so sorry, I didn't look at my watch. So it is improving. It has improved dramatically. The GMC had a 49% strongly agree that they got training hours. So they were on about 30%. We've got it down to 4% were getting interrupted during their, their, their teaching time. How would you rate your work workload? We're perceived as being very service heavy. But to be fair, I don't know that we're any more service heavy than any of the busy Dublin hospitals. And service and clinical activity and training are not necessarily mutually exclusive. We're training people to, to, to do service. So they're not mutually exclusive. But, they, but we had 49.1% perceived as heavy, whereas the General Medical Council, the GMC average is 38.6. So maybe we are a little bit heavy. Nobody found it was very light, interestingly. Now, the key question, would you return to Sligo University Hospital in the future to work? 88% yes, said yes, they would return to work. Interestingly, would you recommend Sligo University to a friend? Only 63% said they would. So is this, the, is this their secret that they're keeping and they don't want anyone else to share? So, in summary, I would say... Success is doing the ordinary things extremely well. We don't need fancy pants things. We need to do the ordinary things well and we need to play to our strengths and look after our junior doctors. They are the doctors of the future. Thank you very much.